Hello, hello. I want to take a quick second and just talk to everybody online. I love you all. Spare with me for a second. Online people, I just want you to know, no matter where you're at, no matter what you're going through, you have a church that believes in you. We're praying for you. We love you. And we're so glad that you're here with us this weekend as we continue in this series called Famous Last Words. Uh, I was, I was kind of struck this week by the famous last words of Steve Jobs, uh, CEO and co-founder of Apple. We know who he is, but his last words were recorded. He died a few years ago of cancer, very tragic and sad. Uh, his last words were these three things. He said, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow. I, I don't know what was going through his mind at that time. I don't know what, 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 what goes through your mind at the last moments of your life. If that was uh, maybe his last loving look at his family, uh, I don't, his life flashed before his eyes maybe, or uh, maybe he just got a little peek, like a sneak peek into eternity. I, I'm not sure, but, but it's powerful. Those last words are powerful. They're, they're emotional. Uh, those last moments of someone's life, I can't, I can't really imagine them for myself. It's hard, it's hard to imagine, isn't it? It's a little bit difficult to think of. I've lost people that I love. I've seen people in their last days of their life and in those last moments. And, and I, it's hard to think of for myself. Maybe you're here and, and you're thinking about it and you don't like to think about it. Like, I don't know what's going to happen next, what's going to happen to my family. I'm not ready to die. I, I don't, I don't want to think about it. Or maybe you're here and you have contemplated uh, death, afterlife, what that means for you. I just want you to know there's always hope. There's always hope. There's always something to live for. And, and there's even hope after life because Jesus is hope. And I believe that for all of us, you're not really truly ready to live until you're ready to die. And so maybe for you, you need to think about it. Uh, wrestle that out with God and, and find out, what am I here for? Uh, and you're here for a purpose. What do I have to live for? And what's going to happen next? Uh, those last moments. This last week, I found out that a high school friend of mine went to be with Jesus. And she was uh, young. It was very sad. Her name's Jessica. Uh, her, her last name was Peel. Mine was Payne. So we were locker buddies all through junior high and high school. We played sports together. And she was just a stellar person. Like just one of those people that you just always wanted to be around. She loved so well. She loved Jesus so much. And uh, it's, it's sad. She, she battled brain tumors for 12 years of her life. And then uh, eventually just this, this past week, uh, went to be with Jesus. And so it's sad. When we lose someone, when we feel those emotions, when we feel that, that real and that raw emotion, I think it makes the words of Jesus that much more emotional because Jesus had some last words. He had some last words for you and me. He had some things that he wanted to say. And Jesus knew what he was saying, and he said it on purpose. Last week we talked about the first of Jesus' last words. It was a word of forgiveness. Even on the cross, even after he had been battered and bruised and hung on the cross, naked, shamed, uh, alone, it, it, even in that moment, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Jesus had a word of forgiveness even in his own pain and suffering and even in his own death. That was the first of Jesus' words. Uh, something was said last weekend that I'll probably carry with me forever. Uh, Brian said, why are you carrying around what Jesus already died for? Why are you carrying that around with you? The past, the past, that thing that happened, that thing that you did, that thing that you said, that pain that they gave you, what they did, what she said, all of those things, that, that, that thing that you obsess over in the past, Jesus died for it. Why are you still carrying it around? And, and there's something really powerful that comes with forgiveness, and that's salvation. We can't change the past, but Jesus has the power to forgive it. He has the power to cover it. It, and you don't have to carry it around and make it yours. Make, make forgiveness your word. Forgiveness is a powerful word, isn't it? It's awesome to think that Jesus forgives us. Forgiveness, it's freeing. Uh, Jesus, the famous last words of Jesus, he had uh, said them on purpose. One goes from one to the other to the other to the other. So it brings us to Jesus on the cross. He's got these two men next to him. 
He's just said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And he's got these two criminals hanging on the cross next to him. And they start to have this conversation together. He's got one on one side and and he is kind of a bully, he's bullying Jesus. Like, if, if you are who you say you are, just get us out of this. He's looking for the bailout. He, he's looking for Jesus to kind of prove himself. And on the other side, you have a man who became a believer in that moment. He looked at Jesus and he saw something different. And he's like, yo, Joe, we got ourselves into this mess. And he doesn't, hasn't done anything wrong. Don't you fear God? And he asked Jesus to remember him in that moment. Now, the man didn't say his name. He didn't say his occupation. He wasn't like, I'm son of Norma and Steve. Uh, It was like, it wasn't wasn't a conversation. Uh, Norma and Steve, we love you. They're in Florida. I just thought of their names. I don't know why. Um, It was just, it was this conversation. He didn't, there was no small talk. I've recognized something about myself. Uh, we, we went on a few airplane rides and there was some small talk. You know airplane small talk? And you're like, I don't really wanna talk, but okay, here we go. I had some airplane small talk. And, and after you say, hi, my name is, my name is, what's the next question? You always know on a plane, if you get the next question, you're in for a long ride. <laughs> Once you stop at names, you're good. You can like turn on your headphones and you're good. But the next question is, what do you do? I realized about myself, every time I'm asked what I do, I say this. I say the same thing every time. I say, I'm actually a pastor. (laughs) It's funny because I actually am. I don't know why I add the word (laughs) actually. I don't know if it's like to soften the blow. Like I think they're going to be like, oh. But both times, on the last two times I've flown, the person has said, Brian can attest, oh, I feel so much better now that I'm sitting next to you. The plane's not going to go down. I'm sitting next to the pastor. <laughs> I think that's what they're thinking. I don't know. It's so funny, but I say it. I'm actually a pastor. So in the way that my brain works sometimes when I read God's word is I hear the conversation after the conversation. I don't know. It's strange. But sometimes, I don't know if it's like the, the bedtime story, mom and me. I, I'm not sure. But I hear the conversation after the conversation. So there was no small talk on the cross, which would actually, everybody say actually, actually be pretty funny because I can just picture him saying, you know, uh, hi, my name is, and I do this. What do you do? And Jesus being like, I'm actually the son of God. (laughs) So that's my right thing. But then I go a little step further and think about in heaven, the conversation in heaven. Now bear with me because Again, it's just the way my brain works, okay? So they're in heaven, and, and the guy, the believer, the guy, he says, hey, uh, remember me. Jesus answers him a very uh, specific way. He says, remember me, Jesus, but he gives him no context of who he is, right? It doesn't, how is Jesus supposed to remember him? I mean, Jesus is Jesus, so he remembers everybody. I get it. But uh, as a human being, how would you remember someone if they were just like, Like, can you look at him? I don't know, he was on a cross. Like, that would be hard, so I don't know if he knew what he looked like. And so, how would you remember somebody? So, in heaven, I I, I picture Jesus there. The guy shows up, and he's like, oh, hey, Jesus. Man, those crosses stunk. Like, that was stinky. Um, But we're here, and it's so great here. Thanks, Thanks for remembering me, right? And Jesus is like, I'm sorry, who are you? He's like, it's me, Jose. You said you'd remember me. And Jesus is like, no way, Jose. It's so good to see you. Yep. Okay. There it goes. That's my brain. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. But Jesus said something very uh, awesome to this guy when he said, hey, Jesus, remember me. Jesus said, truly, today you will be with me in paradise. He said today, not tomorrow, not after a long sleep, but today you will be with me in paradise. Let me tell you, friends, you might not be remembered for your name. You might not be remembered for your job, your credits, your accolades, all the things that you have done in this life, but Jesus will remember you. He will. He'll remember you, and he knows your name. Forgiveness and salvation, they go together. Forgiveness and salvation. Forgiveness is for everything in the past. 
You can glance back, it's okay. It's okay to glance back, but it's not okay to dwell there. We can dwell in our past mistakes. We can also dwell in the good old days. Do you know what I'm saying? I wish that things were like they used to be. The, the, the forgiveness is for everything in the past. You don't have to live there. And salvation is for everything that God has for your future. To look forward. I'm saved on purpose. I'm saved for a reason. Everything in front of you. Salvation comes from the Greek word sozo. S-O-Z-O. Sozo. It means healed, restored, made whole, forgiven, set free. It's not just that you are saved from something. You are saved for something. Now, it's kind of like marriage. Just... Think about it for a sec. Marriage. All the singles in the house. Say, hey. Like very, very quiet hands and haze. This is your moment. Like, this is it. This is a good place to meet somebody in church. Can I get an amen? Serve the house, find a spouse. Okay. <laughs> Marriage is not just to save you from singleness. It's not just a rescue from the kids' table at Thanksgiving. Okay. <laughs> Shocker. Marriage is, is more than that. Marriage is getting two people together on this journey to grow together until the end, until the end of their life. They get to do it together. Salvation is a get to, not a I have to. Marriage, my friends, is an I get to, not an I have to. You are saved for a purpose, for a reason, not just saved from something, from hell, from uh, destruction, from uh, a life of loneliness. You are saved for something. Now, the from something is good enough, but you are actually saved for a purpose and a plan. God has a purpose for your life. It's meant to bring two people together. Brian and I actually have coffee together every single day, almost every single day. Usually it's in matching cups because there's like a little green lady on it. Um, don't you judge me. You don't know my budget. I'm just kidding. But <laughs> that's where marriage is built. Every day. Every day decisions. Every day. That's where we talk about everything. And that's where exactly how your salvation is. Salvation is worked out every single day. That's where you build it. That's where it's born. That's where it's built. Uh, the most popular question that I get as a pastor is, what is God's purpose for my life? Like, I'm, I'm supposed to know. You know? Like, like, I'm like, I, well, I got a message from God yesterday, and he said, you are supposed to be a firefighter. Go and do it. Have fun. Bye. No, I don't know what God's purpose is for anyone's life, but you work it out day by day. It's waking up every day, finding life in Jesus, and that should excite you. That should get you going. That should motivate you. You get to find life in Jesus. Now, Elevate Church is a church for unchurched people to find life in Jesus. And sometimes people stop at the word unchurched. Finding life in Jesus is a lifetime event, friends. It is on and on and on every single day. And we get to not only find that life in Jesus, but point other people to that life. How awesome is that? That's something to get worked up about. That's something to get passionate about, excited for. And when people ask me, how can I actually... No, God's will for my life. Like, you've got it all figured out. Jesus, now that guy had a purpose. He had a purpose. How can I know God's purpose for my life? And most people kind of get stuck in this spot. They make it kind of dramatic. Like, almost like if I don't know what I'm here for, I don't have to do it. Like, I can just make it an excuse. Well, I don't know. I don't know why I'm here. I don't know, so I don't have to do anything. Guys, if I can tell you one thing, if you are here and, and you're, you're, you've asked that question before, how can I actually know God's purpose for my life? Everybody say actually. actually. How can I actually know God's purpose for my life? Friends, serve your way into God's purpose for your life. <laughs> serve your way into it. Sometimes you just got to start somewhere. You cannot actually find the purpose for your life by just analyzing it. It's paralysis of, an an of analy analyzing, paralysis of analysis. There it is. You, you get paralyzed by overanalyzing things. Anybody in the house analyze things a little bit too much? There's some people on the front row that are truthful and a few in the back row that are like kind of, sort of, maybe. 
you're overanalyzing, raising your hand to admit that you overanalyze stuff. You can analyze it so much. Where's my perfect fit? Where, where does God want me? This is a family, and we all help out. We all pitch in. Now, we have a family of five, and sometimes they can overanalyze their gifts and talents, and I'm like, sister, you're, unless you're going to live in a hotel, you got to know how to put the towels away, okay? Just do it. Figure it out. Do something. Shove them in. I don't care. Just do it. You can't overanalyze. You have to just take a step. You have to take a step. Do something. God will fill in the the gaps. He'll show you if it's a good fit for you. He'll help you. He'll navigate you through. There's lots of places to serve here. There's lots of places to serve in your community. Just step out. Love somebody. Serve somebody. Find somebody that God wants you to serve. Serve your way into God's purpose. Now, this reminds me of David, King David in the Bible. He's like a prime example of this because he went from a shepherd in the, the fields taking care of the sheep, picking up the poop and, you know, dealing with the sheep. And he went from that to, to become a waiter where he brought, like, his brother's lunch in the field and then they just started slapping armor on him and told him to go fight a giant. So he went from a shepherd to a waiter to a giant slayer to king. And he took steps along the way. No job was more important than the other. He wasn't thinking, I have to do this before I can do that. He just stepped into it. He saw an opportunity and he stepped into it. That means whatever you need, God, I'm here. Whatever you need, I'm available. That means, okay, God, you need me to go love my neighbor? I'm gonna go love them. God, they need some candy at church? I'm gonna bring some candy. God, they need someone to walk in the parade? They need me to watch some kids? God, I'm there. They need someone to run sound? I'll learn. We've got people who are like, I'll learn. Show me how. It's not that easy, but we'll teach you, but it'll take some time. But it's just stepping into whatever God has. For me, that looks like stacking chairs and serving in junior high ministry for probably around 10 years of my life with junior hires. And now I've had to, and I think, how did I do that for 10 years loving junior hires? No, it was easy because I said, God, I'm available. Just show me how. Give me a heart for it. Sometimes, friends, sometimes we don't have a heart for it until we ask God for the heart for it. You got to step into it. God, help me. Give me a heart for this. I want to love these people. God, what do you want for me? It's like spinning in a circle. God, what do you want? I'm here. And and God's like, you're still spinning. (laughs) Like, Take a step. And then you take a step and you find, oh, okay, This is what I'm meant for. And maybe it's just for today and then tomorrow and the next day. No job is more important than the other. Just start somewhere. We just had growth track here at Elevate. We have another one coming up in May. If you are here, you are here for a purpose. If you are here, you are here for a reason. It is not a mistake that you are sitting in this room. It is not a mistake that you love this church. It's not a mistake that you even maybe like it a little. You're here for a reason. Go to Grow Track. Find out why. God, I love this church. I, I, I just keep showing back up. So something's there. They keep telling me to. They're like, just keep coming back. I'm like, all right. I'm going to keep coming back. And you do. And then God says, hey, take a step. And sometimes we can push that away. God, I just want to keep coming back. I just want to sit in the back. I don't want to be noticed. And God's like, but you don't know what you're missing. Step into it. See what God has for you because salvation gives you a purpose. You are not just saved from something. You are saved for something. If you've ever wondered, what am I here for? I'm talking about planet Earth. What am I here for? You are here to honor and glorify God. How do you do that? You seek and save the lost. Every single day you have a purpose That's the mission, that's the plan, that's the purpose God has for you. Philippians 2.13 says, it is God who works in you to fulfill his good purpose. It's easy to lose sight of our salvation, isn't it? Like we've been saved, we know who Jesus is, we know who he is to us, but along the way life happens, it's easy to lose sight of it. But when we lose sight of what our salvation is, or maybe you don't have a good, clear picture of salvation and what that means for you. And so you're, not, you're still wrestling it out. That's okay, ask questions. Someone, someone will help you. Maybe you've never started a relationship with Jesus and you don't understand salvation. I'd love to have a conversation with you. 
But when you lose sight of that or when you don't fully understand salvation, it's easy to get focused on a, a, a certain thing. It's easy to get focused on what everybody else is doing wrong, not what you're doing wrong. It's called sins of commission. It's looking at someone else, and in reality, if I can just put it in easy terms, you become a Christian cop. It's, it's a thing. You become a Christian cop. You start pointing out what everybody else is doing, and you see them, and you're like, oh, why are you doing that? Why are you wearing that? Did you see what she's doing? Did you see what they said? Did you hear that? And, and you start to pick apart what everybody else is doing and you don't see what you're doing. You can get stuck in this spot. I've gotten stuck here before. The people in my house, I can overcorrect. If you have anyone to pray for, pray for my children. They are growing up with two pastors and they get sermons every single day. But we can overcorrect people and we can start, it's, it's easy to focus on what everybody else is doing wrong and giving them the lectures than it is to look at ourselves and see maybe where we're missing it and we, we, it's what missteps that we're making. You can get stuck here in this place because we can work so hard on not doing anything wrong. And maybe you've gotten to a good place where you're like, I'm, I, I'm not doing much wrong, God. Look at me. I'm so great. You can get to that place where you're actually not doing much wrong, but you're also not doing anything right. Because what's right is actually focused on your purpose. Uh, what's right is seeing the people in your life that need Jesus. What's right is having a different type of mindset. I would take a person with a big heart that wants to love Jesus over a self-righteous person with a red pen. I would. I want to be that person. I want to be that person with a big heart, but maybe I got a little bit of mess. Jesus, forgive me. We all do. We're not perfect. Than to have a red pen correcting everybody else's mistakes. Because even until the end, even until the cross, Jesus was inviting people into the family of God. Even on the cross. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And even on the cross, he was looking for people who would truly surrender, truly believe, and look to him. And he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. If you're being a Christian cop, just stop. Just stop. Just look inside. What do I got going on? <laughs> and when you're focused on that, you kind of lose sight of what everybody else is doing because only Jesus and only God can change their heart. The people in my house that I want to overcorrect and do things for and help them reach their potential, God, I just want them to reach their potential. He's like, let me change their heart. I'm a lot better at it than you. Let God change people's hearts because he wants to change yours too. Even to the cross, Jesus Jesus was inviting people into his family. The third word of Jesus was a word of relationship. Relationship. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. Mary and John were standing before him at the cross. They were grieving. They were sad. Uh, there was a few other Marys there. There was actually three. Three Marys and John. All the other disciples had scattered, but Mary, Mary believed in Jesus. That was a different relationship. That was a mother-son relationship. Arguably, she probably believed in him first, because when she visited Elizabeth and Jesus was in her tummy, Elizabeth, her cousin, looked at her and said, blessed is she who believed that God would fulfill his promise to her. I love Mary, because she has this, this big heart and the, the hardest job. I don't know how she raised Jesus. Even though he was probably really, really good and didn't do much wrong, I don't think he ever probably sassed her. <laughs> she had a really hard job, but she loved Jesus. She believed in who Jesus was. She believed in him maybe before he was ready to believe in himself. She, she was there when she said, hey, do your first miracle, Jesus. Show up. You can do it. And he was like, I don't know if it's my time. She believed in him so much. And then you had John standing next to Mary, and John was Jesus' best friend best friend. All the other disciples had scattered for different reasons. They had their reasons. But Jesus was there and he was staring at the people, the, the faithful, the few, the people that were there, even to the end. Jesus was there, or Mary was there from, you know, birth till death. So she was there with him the longest. But he's looking at these people that he loves the most. It would have been so easy for Jesus to go, where's Peter? Where'd Peter go? Oh yeah, he denied me. Where, where'd Judas? Where's Judas? Oh, he betrayed me. It would have been so easy for Jesus to see who wasn't there. 
but he focused on the people that were there. In our lives, it's so easy when we go through something difficult, or maybe life has gone on a long time, it's so easy to focus on who's not there. God, where did they go? Oh yeah, they betrayed me. God, where did they go? Oh yeah, they left me. It's so easy to focus on who's not there, but it's time to start focusing on who is still there. Who's actually still in your life? Jesus understood this, and he honored the people that he loved the most, even till the end. He looked at Mary and he said, woman, here is your son. Saying woman wasn't disrespectful to her. It actually translates better to maybe ma'am, ma'am. And he didn't call her mother because he didn't want to point out her grief. He honored John. John, here is my mother, the person that I maybe love the most in life and I want you to take care of her. From that day on, John took her into his home like his own mother. And maybe... Maybe Jesus in that moment, maybe his life flashed before his eyes. I don't know. Maybe, maybe the, the, the future he was looking at, but I, I'm not sure what he was exactly focused on, but he wanted to uh, protect and love on his family even after he was gone from this earth. I do know that he was thinking of all of us. I do know that in that moment, uh, taking care of his mother's earthly life was very similar to how he feels about you and I. Because Jesus redefined family. He redefined what family is. He looked at his mom and he looked at John. One was related by blood. One was related uh, by just a friend who became family. And Jesus redefined family in that moment. He said all the people that aren't your family can be your family when you're in the family of God. And maybe there's some people in your life that aren't the right family for you. That's okay. That's okay to define who is maybe not the right family, the people that you have the closest, because who you hang out with the most matters. Who you hang out with the most matters. Do you have the right family? Jesus redefined family, and he made a family of God, the church. That's why the church is so important. It, it, it fuels us. It keeps us going. It excites us. Uh, he, he, he wants to, us to take care of each other, and to love on each other. But there's sometimes there's people that aren't the right family. Luke eleven twenty three 23 says, anyone who isn't with me actually opposes me. And anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. Everybody say actually. I don't know about you, but I want to stand shoulder to shoulder with Jesus in any battle. I saw how he endured the cross. <clears throat> I read about <clears throat> what happens next. I'll stand shoulder to shoulder with Jesus any day. I want to be with him. I actually want to live my life with Jesus. I want, to, I want his purpose to be my purpose. I want his will to be my will. I want to fulfill the purpose that he began. God, Jesus didn't focus so much on his potential. He could have been anything. But he did focus on his purpose. And he fulfilled his purpose and the promises of God. And maybe you're kind of thinking, those are my peeps. Those are my homies. And you're listening to this and you're like, those are my people. I'm not sure what you're saying here if you want me to just to like quit on them. No, don't quit. They probably need to know about Jesus. But who you hang out with the most matters. Jesus redefined family. Uh, maybe it's why you haven't progressed in your salvation yet. You're holding on to something or someone. And I get it. I've held on to things before. Sometimes we just have to let them go. Don't miss this. Are you stuck? Are you stuck in the past? Have you stopped at the prayer and you haven't continued living what Jesus has for you? Are you stuck in maybe uh, what, what you think should be or could be? Are you stuck with the wrong family? Did you stop when you asked Jesus into your heart and you forgot that salvation is a lifelong journey? Don't stop at the prayer. Uh, I just wanted to share really quick a little short excerpt from my friend Jessica's obituary. And I know that sounds really dark, but it's actually really bright because she had a, a life lived well. 
And when I think about this message and I think about the actually and I think about the purpose that God has for us and I think about the family of God, all of us sitting here in this room, when we believe in Jesus, when we say, Jesus, I want to follow you, and we step into the actually, something changes, and that happened for Jessica. So I just want to read a quick little excerpt from it. It says, even with the physical limitations, Jessica cherished each day that her Lord and Savior gave her. She most enjoyed time with her children and watching their love grow. Jessica's main focus has always been her relationship with God. Her faith has been an inspiration to all that have known her. She understood that each minute of her life was a gift from God. She always rested secure in the knowledge that God had promised her full and perfect healing with him when he called her home. Jessica was reminded every day of her mortality. And it renewed her steadfast love of and faith in her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom she fully committed herself as he did to her. Jesus stepped right, Jessica stepped right into the arms of Jesus. In that moment when she left this earth, she was with Jesus in paradise. She fulfilled her purpose because, friends, we keep working out our salvation until the day we hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You keep working it out. You keep wrestling it out. It's not perfect. I'm not asking you to be perfect. I'm just saying keep working it out. Keep walking it out. Keep asking God, God, God. Do I have the right people in my life? Do I have equal parts, the people that are speaking into me and the people that I'm looking to reach a hand out to and tell them about Jesus? God, God, who is in my life? God, the purpose you have for me is to honor and glorify you and I wanna do it with every area of my life. Give me someone to love. Give me someone to serve. Friends, there are people that need to know that today, if they died, they would step into eternity and they would be with Jesus. Jesus said, Uh, today you'll be with me in paradise. There are people that need to know that this Christian life is not a solo sport. It is hard. It is not easy. And they need to know that you've got their back. They need to know that they are not alone, that they are loved, that they are worthy, that they have a purpose, and that actually God knows their name. God, guys, there are people that need to know. They need to know that. There was a quote from C.S. Lewis in her obituary, and it said, you never know how much you actually believe anything until its truth or falsity becomes a matter of life and death to you. Life and death is on the line. The purpose that God has for you is a life and death matter. There are actually people dying and going to a Christless eternity. They're living purposeless lives and they don't have to. And you have the answer and you're keeping it to yourself. Let's actually step into the purpose. Let's take a step. Let's serve somebody. Let's love somebody. Let's actually realize that there's something on the line here. Do you know what actually means? In the dictionary, actually means The truth in fact and in act. The truth in act and in fact. We have the actions. We know what to do. Nobody needs to tell you how to love your neighbor. You know how. Their dog's annoying. I get it. But you know how to love them like only you know how. You don't need to be told how to love your family. It might not always be easy, but it's doable. You don't need to be told how to tell someone about Jesus. All you have to do is live your life and they can watch. I can sit down and give you the Romans road. It's good. I can email it to you. If you need to know how to lead someone to Jesus and you want the perfect words, they're found in the book of Romans in the Bible. I can email you that. I can tell you that. I can tell you that you just love on people and tell them how Jesus changed your life because nobody can take away your story. And you can share that with people and and something something might change in them. I can tell you how to do it, but you know how to do it because we need to live more in the actually We need to live more in that place. We 
We like to step back and live in our own actually, but what is God's actually? God's actually says you are forgiven because he said, God, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. God says you have a purpose. You are saved. You have salvation. And he said you're not just saved from something. You're saved for something. Truly, you will be with me today in paradise and you have a place You have a family, the family of God. Jesus redefined the family. He gave us this church. And these are actuallys. You are actually forgiven. You are actually saved and set free. And you actually have a family in the family of God. I want to take a moment. And maybe you've been living not in the actually. You know that actually it's in your head, but it's not in your heart. That's okay, we can all get in that, that mode sometimes. But the actually is in act and in fact. The fact is Jesus loves you. The fact is Jesus loves everybody outside of this room. The act is, God, help me take that step. Help me take that, that step of serving someone and loving someone today. If, if you're here and you're like, I just need to live more in the actually. Let's be honest with ourselves in this moment. Would you just raise your hand? I know everybody's got their eyes open and that's okay. God, I need to live more in the actually. Awesome. God sees you. God sees your heart, and he knew it before you even just realized it in this message. He knows you. He loves you, and he's excited for you to live in the actually. Now I want to ask another question. Everybody's heads are still up and eyes are still open. I want to ask a question about your salvation. You are saved for a purpose. Maybe you stopped at the prayer. Maybe you stopped at the prayer, and that's like stopping at the altar in marriage and saying, hey, we said the vows. We made the decision. We said we loved each other. But then never growing another moment, never spending another second together, never telling each other you love each other. That's not how this thing works. Don't stop at the prayer. Or maybe you're here and you've never prayed that prayer before. If you need your relationship with God to be right today, it should excite you because finding a life in Jesus is an everyday event. If you are here and you're saying, I'm in the family of God, all these people here, they love me, and I know that my relationship with God is not right, I just want you to raise your hand in this moment too for, for God to see. God knows your heart, and he knows that you need him more than you know that you need him. He's a lot better at saving you than you are at saving yourself. Can I get an amen? If there's anybody here, yeah, I see you. Anybody else? bravely would say, I see you too. Anybody else that would say, I just need, I need to get my relationship with God right. It starts with a prayer. How do you become more like someone? You spend time with them. You spend time with them. So let's talk to God in this moment and let's tell him that we love him. God, we love you so much. God, for those people in here that raised their hand, I saw two or three, God, that said, I need, I need God in my life. Maybe I just need to get things right with God. In this moment, with their family around them, God, I just pray that they would pray this prayer to you, that they would say, God, I need you. Just in the quiet of their heart, thank you for sending me Jesus to die for me, that his words are true, that they're meaningful to me. God, in this moment, I just want my heart to be clean, my heart to be right with you. Thank you for forgiving me, saving me, and setting me free. And God, for the rest of us, that we would live in the actually. God, that we would see that you are actually God. God, that we would see that you actually have forgiven us, that you've saved us, and that you have a purpose and a plan for us in this life. God, we worship you, we honor you, we praise you, we give you all the glory. In your name we pray.